Okay. So the, fir Oops. the first question was, what if, what if you have a vector-valued function like this? R of t is, for example, how about t cubed sine of t and t to the fourth cosine t. Let's say you have something like this. So then there's a common term. Right? There's something that's common to all components of the vector. So you could factor this out and s this term out and say that, well, that is uh, t cubed multiplied by the sine of t in the first coordinate and what in the second coordinate? t cosine t. Okay, so then now, <coughs> what if you wanted to compute the derivative of this? So v, the derivative of r, well, you will use the product rule. So it will be like so. It will be the derivative of t cubed and then sine t, t cosine t. plus t cubed times the derivative with respect to t of sine t, t cosine t. <coughs> okay, so then this will be 3t squared sine t, t cosine t. plus t cubed and in the second coordinate in the in the second derivative here it will be what uh, cosine of t and then cosine of t minus t sine t okay, so does that answer your question So, I see, I see. Okay, so, <coughs> let's think about it. So the question is, is what if it looks like this? What if it looks like um, R of t is, say, sine of t over t, cosine of t over t? So that you could say that r of t is like this, the sine of t, cosine of t, and then divided by t, like so. Would you use the quotient rule to compute the derivative? And the answer is, I think it might work, actually. But what I can tell you what will certainly work is if you write it like this, t inverse sine t, t cosine t, and then use the product rule. That will certainly work. I f and my, my intuition is telling me that there shouldn't be anything wrong with the quotient rule there. Okay, <coughs> but of course it wouldn't make any, it doesn't make any sense, you know, there, there are instances where it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. Like, so then this is a quotient, it's a quotient of a vector and a scalar, so the fact that the denominator is a scalar leads me to believe the quotient rule is probably going to be fine, but never is it okay to have the denominator to be a vector, right? because in this class it, there's no meaning assigned to the division by a vector. Okay, so then on this, on this, so now I'm looking at a, uh, what is this called? WebAssign, a WebAssign question. Now where, what step uh, am I supposed to be looking at? Okay. How did they do it? <coughs> so, the derivative. So, let's write down what it is that they have on the page. So, at some point in the computation, they arrive at a value of t hat that looks like this. So, I'll write it, write it in angle bracket notation. Negative 2 sine of pi t in the first coordinate. 
and cosine of pi t in the second coordinate. And then divided by the square root, the square root of 4 sine pi t squared plus cosine pi t squared. Okay, and then they compute the derivative. So, if I had to, if I had to guess what they did, uh, yeah, the derivative of of that. So two sine t. Okay, so then let's just compute the derivative. Let's just compute the derivative, and I'm going to view this as written in this way. <coughs> t is this thing for sine of pi t squared plus cosine of pi t squared, but I'm going to write it with a fractional exponent, negative one-half, times negative two sine of pi t, and then cosine of pi t. Okay, so then now. So this takes me back to the previous discussion where I said, you know, there's this other vector called n and you want to avoid computing n if you can. Okay, and the reason why you want to avoid, compute it, avoid computing it is, is exactly what's about to happen right here. <laughs> We're about to compute the derivative of t, because remember, what is n? It's the derivative of t divided by the magnitude of the derivative of t. And computing the derivative of t is what you want to avoid, so that's what I'm being asked <laughs> to do right now. That's fine. So then let's do it. So then I would say that, generally speaking, you want to you wanna avoid this because of the pain that's about to ensue. But let's do it. <laughs> okay, <coughs> so negative one-half. So I'm going to, so let's write it, you know, a schematic here. This will be u, uh, as in some thing, and this will be v, some other thing. So then we're going to do the product rule. So it'll be the derivative of u times v plus u times the derivative of v. <coughs> okay, so then negative one half for sine of pi t squared plus cosine of pi t squared to the negative three halves multiplied by negative two sine of pi t cosine of pi t. Okay, so that is u prime v. And then it will pl be plus, <coughs> plus. Oh, I totally, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my brain is elsewhere today. Okay, so now multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which is 8 <coughs> sine of pi t multiplied by cosine of pi t multiplied by pi. Yeah, a little bit, right? So then this is 4 sine of 4 sine squared and 1 sine squared. So you could take one of the sine squareds and one of the cosine squareds and turn it into 1. But it didn't look like the, they were doing that in the solution on WebAssign. So, so I'm going to avoid it for the time being. <coughs> so 8 sine pi t cosine pi t pi plus 2 cosine pi t times times negative sine pi t times pi. So that's the derivative of the first thing. And then now it's multiplied by that vector. So multiplied by negative 2 sine of pi t. So I hope this is convincing you not to do this. <laughs> Okay, times this. <coughs> okay, now plus uv prime, so it will be this term in square parentheses multiplied by negative 2 cosine of pi t pi and then negative sine of pi t pi, like so. Okay, so then now let's 
<laughs> see what magical simplification is going to occur here. So then inside of this square parentheses here, this is 8 pi sine pi t cosine pi t. And this is negative 2 pi sine pi t cosine pi t. So how many, cos how many of these are in here after all of that? Six of them, right? There's six of them. So then I can take that to be six of them and then factor that six out, right? And cancel it with this negative one half to obtain negative three four sine pi t squared plus cosine of pi t squared. And then I factored out, there was six, and so then now there's, I factored out the six, so now it's pi sine pi t cosine pi t. and then multiplied by this vector, negative 2 sine of pi t cosine of pi t. Okay, so that was the first term. So does this term simplify at all? Mm, I can factor out a pi out of this vector, so then plus this term in square parentheses, multiplied by pi, or I can, I can factor out negative pi, so minus pi times <coughs> cosine of pi t sine of pi t. Okay, and this is negative three halves. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So then, what can I say here? So then if I was to continue, I'm not going to continue any further. So if I was to continue any further, I'd probably finish the problem in five more minutes, five minutes that I think aren't worth class time. Okay, so then <coughs> the moral of the story here, <laughs> here is, is I just want to reemphasize that computing the derivative of t is a nasty business. And that's why on the take-home quiz I, al I gave you more than one way to compute n. Right, so then on the take-home quiz, in one case I said, I said, you should consider this equation right here. A is, so A is A T T plus A N N. And on the question that I gave you, right, this is an equation that has five terms in it. It was easy for you to compute four of those five. Computing N would have been complicated, but you can compute everything except N and solve for N like so. You can say that N is a minus a t t over a n. And this turns out to be not actually a big deal to do this. In fact, on the question that you were asking me to solve, it probably would have been, sh <laughs> it probably would be shorter to do this, to compute a, a t, t, and a n, to compute all of those things, and then, s and then solve for a n and multiply, and make sure that it has length one. <laughs> it would be easier to do that. <coughs> okay, so I don't know if that if that answers your question, but but I can assuage some of your fear and say that this kind of thing is not going to appear on the exam. We're we're not going to have you know product rule Olympics on the exam. <laughs> <coughs> yes. In. Okay. I'm not even sure which ones you're talking about. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's another thing that I, s I said in the take-home quiz. So in the take-home quiz, I said this. If you have a plane curve, so this will be a remark. If you have a plane curve, which is equal to x, y, where x and y are each functions of, of <coughs> excuse me, you have a tangent vector, a unit tangent vector, where x and y are both functions of t, then, right, the magnitude of t is 1, right, because it's a unit vector. And so this implies that x squared plus y squared is 1. Right, it being a, a unit tangent vector. 
Then I want you to notice the following. So if I make if I make two new vectors a, one of them will be negative y x. <coughs> so if a is negative y x, then notice notice what the following things that the length of a the length of a is the square root of negative y squared plus x squared, which is y squared plus x squared, which is 1. Okay. And in addition to that, how about t scalar product a? So what will t scalar product a be? It will be 0, because it is negative xy plus xy, which is 0. So what is this telling you about t and a? They're orthogonal. So then this is saying that t is orthogonal to a. So here's another choice. Write b is equal to b is equal to uh, y negative x. So for the exact same reasons, right, for the exact same reasons, the length of b is 1, and t is orthogonal to b. So, in two dimensions, because we have this, because, essentially because the dimension is limited, you can always find these two vectors. And they both are orthogonal to t. And they both have length 1. And when we were talking about the unit normal vector n in the plane, we knew that there were only two options. These are the two options. These are those the ones. So that means that this is a very short way to compute n if you are using a plane curve. But it, it requires additional thought because you generally need to look at the problem and make sure that your normal vector is pointing in the correct direction. Okay, so you, that generally, for me, you know, requires a sketch. So I look at the sketch and I draw th where the unit tangent is and I draw the, the two possibilities for the unit normal and one of them doesn't make any sense, and one of them does make sense. So by, by sense and not sense, I mean things like this. Projectiles need to fall down in a, in a gravitational field. Okay, They don't need to fall up, right? You don't jump out of an airplane and proceed down to its, into space. You jump out of an airplane and proceed down to the ground, because that's just the way it is. Okay, so, so in that question, there are two possibilities for the normal. One of them is saying that you're going to proceed out into space. And one of them is saying you're going to go to the ground. Okay, and only one of those two options makes any sense. So does that answer your question? Okay, other questions? <coughs> other questions? So any questions before we briefly go over 13.1? So I'm going to just introduce 13.1 so that psychologically it can be mulling over in your brain just a little bit, but we're not going to hit it hard or deeply because I know that you have this exam thing looming in your brain. Okay, so then just suspend it momentarily with the thought that we're just going to briefly introduce this new thing and then we'll get back to doing review. Okay, <coughs> okay so section 13.1 and let's see, what is the name that the book calls it? probably surfaces or something. Functions of several variables. Okay. So intro to functions of several variables. Okay, so then here, I'd like to give you the context of calculus. So the context in calculus is this. In calculus one, you study maps which take scalars to scalars. Okay, that's calculus one. We have just finished the first section of calculus two, which is where you study maps that take scalars to vectors. Okay, because, you know, R of T, T is a scalar, and its result is a vector, and we were studying the calculus of such things. Okay, so then that's called the 
generally that math subject is called the differential geometry of space curves. Okay, so then now we're going to switch these two and say, okay, well now we're going to study the maps which take vectors to scalars. Okay, so then after we do maps which take vectors to scalars, then we're going to study something entirely not related called, well, not entirely, but it will feel entirely unrelated called sequences and series. Okay, but the next thing where you're studying maps is in calculus 3 or multivariable calculus or whatever, where you study maps which take vectors to vectors. Okay, so this is the context. You did, you did this part in calculus 1, in calculus 1. We will do these things in Calculus 2. And you will do these things in Calculus 3, multivariable calculus. So does everybody see generally where we are? <coughs> okay. So then that being the case, probably the best thing to do to broach the topic is to give you an example. So here's an example of a function. f of x and y is x squared plus 2y squared. Okay. So the pair xy, the pair xy, this is a vector. Right? But another way to say, another way to say what's happening here is that f is a function of two variables. And it's a function of two variables. So then that because it's a function of two variables, it's a function on a vector. Okay, so then how about the <coughs> result? x squared plus y squared. What kind of thing is that? It's a scalar, right? <coughs> so we're taking a vector and making a scalar. So the first thing I'd like to do is for you to consider the following. <coughs> what if, what if I take f and I, s I make a new function. I'll say that z, z is equal to f of x0. That is to say that I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to plug in y is 0. Okay, so then what happens if I do that? I get what is the new function? x squared. So now consider z is x squared. Well, if you suspend the special place of the symbol y in your brain for just a minute and you draw an axis and you call this the x-axis and this the z-axis, then what would the graph of this equation, z is x squared, look like? Parabola. Parabola that opens up, goes to the origin. Wonderful. So any question about, about this notion? So now, if I did that to x, if I did that to x, then I could probably do it to y also. So I could say, how about z is f of 0, y? So what, do you, what happens if I do that? Right, 2y squared. So z is 2y squared. Okay, so if I again... If I again draw an axis, okay, and call this y and this part here z, then 2y squared is also a parabola. But as far as its shape is concerned to the parabola directly above it, how will 2y squared appear? It will be narrower. It will be taller. So it will look something like this. Okay, so then now, what's happening here, what's actually happening here is that if you were to take this function, f of x and y, and you were to plot it like so, so I need to draw a, <laughs> a three-dimensional coordinate axis now, so then you're just going to have to bear with me. So this will be z, one of these will be x and y, let's see, I need this over here too. Oops. Okay, and this goes down. 
Okay, so then now, this right is sort of underneath the plane, right? So the vertical axis is always called Z in this case. So the two other axes, one of them has to be X and one of them has to be Y. So then how do you determine which one is X and which one is Y? The right hand rule, right? This has to perform, this has to construct a right handed coordinate system. Okay, so that means that if you, if the first variable is X and the second variable is Y, so that means if you perform the cross from X to Y, then the result has to be in the direction of Z. So where does X go? Right here. X goes here and Y goes here. X goes here and Y goes here because if X is coming out, and y is parallel with the page, then you cross from x to y and your thumb is pointing in the direction of z. So this is the only way because if it was the other way, if y was this one, then you would have to cross from this one to that one and your thumb would be pointing down and that wouldn't be a right-handed coordinate system, that would be a left-handed coordinate system. Okay, <coughs> so then now, what I could do is at each point in the plane, each point in the xy plane, I could assign a height. So then, if I am drawing parallel to y, parallel to the y-axis, then I get this parabola. Something that looks like this. Okay. But if I was to draw parallel to the x-axis, I get the fatter blue parabola. Okay, so now here is where things become questionable. <laughs> Okay, so then, <coughs> let's see if I can make it look right. So then what's happening here is that there is, if I was to cut a surface like this, then at every cut, there would be an elliptical cross section. So then, <coughs> if I was to look at this from the top, if I was to look at this from the top, then every cut would look like this, an ellipse. And the fat ones, uh, the, the skinny one, I would see if I was to take this one red ellipse right here and make it fat and right here, then I would see that and that and that and that. So looking at the surface from the top. So what, th what is this thing? This is a parabola. Right, it's a parabola, but it's in a higher dimension that you're accustomed, than you're accustomed to seeing. Right, it's a parabola that has an elliptical cross-section. Okay, so then such an example is something like a satellite dish. Right? Some satellite dishes, most satellite dishes are parabolic surfaces of one sort or another. They don't usually have elliptical cross-sections, but they can have elliptical cross-sections. Okay, so this is like a, a bowl right, that goes infinitely up, so high that you wouldn't be able to pour anything in it. It's because it goes all the way up. So any question about this surface, what this is, <coughs> what this surface represents? So generally speaking, this is what we're going to be dealing with. Right? So then the, you know, in 24, you know, 17, the idea of a function is just some, some sort of thing you can draw, and you're accustomed to seeing that. So now what it's going to be is at every point above the plane, we're going to assign a height, and the result is going to be some kind of surface, right? Like a mountain range. So I could take my hand and I could put it on this surface and move it. If it was a smooth surface, I could smoothly move my hand along the surface. Okay, so an example of such a surface would be a, uh, the surface of the Earth. Right? So, for example, you know, Texas or even UTD, right, has a certain surface. To every point on UTD campus, there is a highest above every point on the plane of UTD campus, there's a highest point. So then such a thing is a function. So, you know, would that be continuous? Would it be a continuous function? So I would say probably not, right? If the buildings are at right angles to the ground, then there would have to be a discontinuous jump from the ground to the top of the building. Okay, but maybe that's a little philosophical because we're talking about real things and then there's quantum dynamics and quantum mechanics. Whatever, so we'll ignore that, right? <coughs> okay, uh, so what is the name for the surface of the Earth? That, that is a certain name. It is a 
a sphere. A sphere. Right, so then let's find, let's see if anyone can tell me the equation of the surface of, a, of the top half of a sphere. So what is it? So what is one? So how about, how about what is the equation for, a, for a, the entire sphere? How about the entire unit sphere? So x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 1. So let's see, why does this make sense? So that's the set of all, if you name all of the vectors in space with coordinates x, y, z, that's the, that's the set of all points in space that have distance 1 from the origin. So what is that? That's the unit sphere. Okay, so then I could solve for z squared and say that z squared is 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And then <coughs> I could take square roots of both sides and determine that there are actually two ways to solve for z, right? There is z is negative the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And z is positive square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. Okay. So then now, these two, these two solutions correspond to two different parts of the sphere. What part of the sphere does this correspond to? This is the bottom half of the sphere. Okay, and this is the, the top half. Okay, so then now, if you were at the North Pole, if you were at the North Pole of the Earth or the North Pole of this sphere or whatever, then if you were just extremely tiny, extremely tiny in, in comparison to the size of this sphere, then the sphere would look, what would, how would it look to you? It would look flat. It would look flat, just like if you're a human, right? If, if there was, if you could go out into the middle of uh, the United States in the plain, you know, it just, it looks like it extends more or less flatly forever. Okay, and that's because you are very small in comparison to the size of the Earth. So then the tangent surfaces that we're going to be dealing with, they're not tangent lines, they are tangent planes. They're tangent planes. So what we're going to be dealing with is now we're going to still talk about this idea of tangency, except no more is it going to be tangent lines or currently uh, tangent circles, but now we're going to be talking about tangent planes. Okay, tangent planes. So now I have another question for you to try and export something from calculus 1 to calculus 2. The bottom half of the plane, I mean the bottom half of the sphere, would you say it's concave up or concave down? Up. I'd say it's up. It would hold water, right? It would hold water. How about the top half, the half of the plane? Would you say it's concave up, or would you say it's concave down? I'd say down, right? There's no manner in which it could hold water reasonably. So now I have a question for you. What if, imagine that I have a horse, right? If I brought in a horse here, okay, su such that its head is here, its tail is here, right? Then if I move my hand along the horse's spine, then like this, right? As a spine that has this kind of bending in it. Would this, would the spine be concave up or concave down? Up, right? A horse's spine is concave up, like so. But your legs, when you saddle a horse, are like this. So is that concave up or is that concave down? That's concave down. Ah, so, so the concavity is going to depend on which direction you're measuring, right? If you measure, if you measure a horse, right, the, the surface of a horse in this direction, it's concave up along its spine. If you measure it along its ribs, it's concave down. Ah, so then, right, such a situation is not possible in calculus one, right? because there's only one direction to measure because there's only one variable. So when there's more than one variable, you can measure in more than one direction and you can determine more than one concavity depending on that direction. So such a point, <laughs> such a point where it is concave up 
in one direction and concave down in another direction is called a saddle point. <laughs> because it looks like a horse's saddle. Okay. <coughs> so then just a, trying to draw that briefly. So then here's an example of such a function that has this property. Z is x squared minus y squared. Or I could say, how about just f of x and y is z squared minus x squared. So then the reason why it has this appearance, the reason why it looks like this is because if I was to say that I'm going to consider the surface that results when I let y be 0, so f of x and 0, then the result is I get z is x squared. Now that is a parabola which opens up. Whereas if I consider the surface z, which is where I let uh, x be 0, then I get negative y squared. So that is z is negative y squared, and that is a parabola which opens down. So what this is saying is along the x direction it's concave up, and along the y direction it's concave down, so the result, the result is something like this. So in one direction it looks like looks like this. And it's very difficult to draw surfaces and I'm well aware of that and I also will submit to you it's very difficult to for me to grade you trying to draw a surface. So that basically doesn't happen. Okay. So then now what I'm trying to say is that this right here going over, that would be your legs, and this would be the spine. So this thing, this point right here at the middle, is called a saddle point. Okay, so for those of you that find this, this kind of thing interesting, there are even more other things that are more exotic that we don't talk about in this class, such things like a monkey saddle and other things like that. Because, you know, a monkey, right, because they have a tail, right, they would need right? They would need one trough for one leg, one trough for their other leg, and one trough for their tail. So then you have sort of the meeting of three, three troughs. So really depending on what direction you're measuring, the concavity changes. So that's called a monkey saddle. This one is, and I'm not, I'm not actually joking. It's a, it's a, it's a fact, right? Mathematically, there are mathematicians talking about monkey saddles. Okay, good. <coughs> so any questions about this? Okay, so then the last thing I want to talk about before we mm, return to review is the following example. <coughs> okay, so I never ask you to draw, I'll never ask you to draw a, a surface, okay, not a three-dimensional representation of a surface, but I may ask you to do the following, okay, and this is called uh, this is an example of making contours. Contours. Also called isocontours. Okay, so then now, <coughs> someone stop me when you know who I am impersonating. There's a high pressure system coming in from the north, blah, 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 blah. Okay, who am I impersonating? A meteorologist, right? The weatherman. So then what is it what is it that they're drawing, right? They're looking at something like this and they have, you know, they write H here and then they you know have the thing like this. You know, and they keep making all these nice drawings. You know, maybe they put an L here. <coughs> what is it? Th what are these lines that they're drawing? So, what are their names? Does anyone know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they are contour lines. <laughs> okay, but but specifically, specifically, these are isobars, right? They're isobars. They're lines of constant pressure, right? So, what it's saying is that everywhere along this line right here. Right, there's a certain pressure. So this is a low pressure cell, so maybe it's really, really low pressure, like 
I think that 26, 26 bars or whatever, that's really low. Okay, and then maybe this one is 30, well, it would have to be 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. So maybe this, all along this line, is a constant pressure of 31. So in, in here, inside of this line, it has pressure 31 or greater. So in here, in between these two lines, it's between 30 and 31. In between these two, it's between 29 and 30, 28 to 30, or 28 to 29, 27 to 28, etc. So does everybody see the way it goes? So now, the way you could understand this is like this. If I took, right, if I took that map, if I took that map and I constructed a mountain range that had height, right, a surface that had height, you know, 26 inches all the way to 31 inches, right, and then I took it and I laid it out flat, then I could start, I could start cutting it with a large samurai sword, right, at 40, I cut nothing, at 39, I cut nothing, at several more, I cut nothing, and then finally I get down to 31, and I see this one little cut that I made, and I keep lowering the blade, at, at 30 I see a cut, 29 I see a cut, all the way down to 26, Right, 26 is the last cut that I see, and then there's no more cuts on the surface. So does everybody see the way it goes? So these, these are called isocontours because they are lines, and that is where whatever it is that you're measuring is constant. So someone give me another example besides isobars where we talk about iso, isocontours in physical science. Topographical maps, right? And in this case, they're called... Yeah, these, in this place, I guess they're called contours, right? So, I, I think I think they're called contours. Okay, so then like an elevation map, right? An elevation map. They draw closed curves that are lines of constant elevation. Okay, what's another example in physical sciences? Sorry? Okay, depth chart. So that's still a line of constant depth. Okay, so what else? Trees. Okay, so how about isotherms? Right, isotherms. That's another thing the meteorologist does. He tells you where the temperature is. Besides the pressure, you know, temperature and pressure are related but not identical. Okay, so is there, yes? Rainfall. That's another good one, right? Okay, so any questions about that these things are physically relevant? Okay, they're relevant. So then now here's an example. A function f of x and y is equal to the square root... <coughs> of 16 minus 4x squared minus y squared. So, so <coughs> if that 4 wasn't there, if the 4 wasn't there, it would be uh, 16 minus x squared minus y squared. It w and, and that would look a lot like the previous example, 1 minus x squared minus y squared. So then the previous example was the top half of a sphere of radius 1. So if this was if this 4 in the 4x squared was missing, this would be the top half of a sphere of radius 4. Right? The top half of a sphere of radius 4, but that 4 is there. So it's sort of messing things up. So let's try and see what happens. Okay? So in particular, what we're going to do is we are going to compute the isocontours C is equal to zero. Uh, what other ones are easy? <coughs> In the book here. C is equal to zero. We'll do one and four. Okay, so what is this saying? <coughs> this is saying we're going to we're going to solve Z is equal to F of X and Y for C is zero, one, and four. Z is 0, 1, and 4. So then now, if we solve this 0 in the case that C is 0, 0 is equal to the square root of 16 minus 4x squared minus y squared. So let's attempt to rearrange this equation into something that we better understand. So then I can square both sides and say that 0 is equal to 16 minus 4x squared minus y squared. Okay, then I can move the 
x squared and y squared terms to the other side and obtain 4x squared plus y squared is 16. And now for some reason that will become obvious, I'm going to divide everything by 16 and obtain x squared over 4 uh, plus y squared over 16 is 1. And now it should be looking quite similar to something that you know, so I'll write it now finally in a standard form. x squared over 2 squared plus y squared over 4 squared is 1. So now, at this juncture, you should realize what this is. What is this? This is an ellipse. It's an ellipse centered at the origin with x minor radius 2 and y major radius 4. Okay? So then now, again, if we do, <coughs> if we do c is equal to 1. If c is 1, then now we're going to solve 1 is equal to the square root 1 is equal to the square root of 16 minus 4x squared minus y squared. Okay, so I can square both sides. 1 is equal to 16 minus 4x squared minus y squared. So then now I can move the x squareds and y squareds to the other side, subtract 1 from both sides and get 15, and then obtain the following. x squared divided by 15 over 4 plus y over 15 is 1. Okay, now what is this? Uh, y squared, yes. So what is this? It's an ellipse. It's an ellipse, and, you know, these aren't particularly nice <laughs> radii, but they are nevertheless radii. So this is, I could write it like this, the square root of 15 over 4 squared plus y squared over the square root of 15 squared is equal to 1. So then this, this is an ellipse with x minor radius, the square root of 15 over 4, and y major radius, the square root of 15. So then this ellipse is a smaller ellipse that fits inside of the previous ellipse. So what's going to happen is, is if we were to continue, if we were to continue solving for such isocontours, and then if we were to plot them, we would see the following. So it's y major, so like this. So on some scale, this would be c is 1. And then on maybe the bigger one, would be c is 0. And then if we were to solve one more, <coughs> c is 4, then we would get 4 is the square root of 16 minus 4 x squared minus y squared. And then I square both sides and get 16 is 16 minus, x minus 4 x squared minus y squared squared, so that 4x squared plus y squared is 16, uh, is 0. So then what is the solution to this? There's only one solution, and that is when x and y are both 0, so that last contour is that point right there. So that is c is 4. So then, now, what is this thing? Describe to me the surface that we are considering. Okay, okay. So then, what is this surface that we're looking at here? It's not the top half of a sphere. It's the top half of a ellipse, right? An elliptical-looking sphere. So it would be like if I took a soccer ball, right, and squished it out until it was no longer a sphere but an ellipse. Okay, an elliptical sphere. So such a thing is called, what, an elliptical spheroid, I guess? <coughs> Wonderful. So any question about this? So the isocontours that I'll ever ask you to plot are, again, always going to be conic sections. 
Okay, so then I'll give you, you know, say here's a function. I want you to plot these specific contours. Every one of those contours is going to be a conic section. That is to say, it's going to be a parabola. It's going to be a circle, an ellipse, a hyperbola, things like this. Okay, so then how about how about what if I was to ask you to consider a saddle point, and you were to make these isocontours. So then now, <laughs> now it would be like we take the horse, right, and we're sort of cutting it, right, plane by plane by plane. Right? What would the what would the cross sections look like as you cut, 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 cut? So imagine just a saddle if the horse thing is disturbing you. Okay. So then, <laughs> what would it what would it look like? What would the cross sections look like? Each each cross section would all of them are the same. They are all what? What are they? I can't hear you. Ellipses? No, not not this case. If all of the cross sections were ellipses, then it would probably be a parabola or a or a spherical, uh, a elliptical sphere. But in this case, we're dealing with a saddle. We're dealing with a saddle. So all of the cross sections are going to be hyperbolas. They're all going to be hyperbolas. Wonderful. And so the reason why they're going to be hyperbolas is because consider what a contour, what that would imply about a contour plot. <coughs> right, this is a line of constant, a line of constant height. A line of constant height. A line of constant height. So these are lines of constant height. So if this is the tallest spot right here, and you're looking at the top of a horse, right, the top of a saddle, so the, your legs go up and down. So then as you're going this way, the height is increasing, or decreasing, I mean to say, right, because your legs go that way. So then now, as you go this way, up the saddle, right, the saddle goes upward. And as you go back this way, the saddle goes upward. <coughs> right? So then this would be like what we're looking at here. We could say that this is height height 10 and then 11. Or no, yeah, then 9 and then 8. <coughs> and so this one would also be 8, 7, 6, 5, <coughs> like this. So then this is what the contour map of a saddle looks like. Wonderful. Okay, so any question about this example? So contour maps and surfaces. So this is what we're going to be talking about, and we're going to talk about it pretty seriously on Thursday. But for now, I just want you to be thinking about this. Okay, and I can also tell you now, it would be very beneficial to you for you to look at section 13.1 and look at all of the different surfaces and become accustomed to them. Okay, because most people are not naturally accustomed to them because you haven't had much experience thinking about them analytically. Okay, so any questions about these things before we re start reviewing? <coughs> if you went which way? To the very top? Yeah. Ah. Ah, ah. So then this right here, this is still 9, 8, and this one would again be eight, seven, six. <coughs> okay, good. So now we review for a little bit. So is there any specific kind of question that you would like to review? Any specific kind of question? <coughs> Finding where a graph crosses itself. Okay, crosses itself. Do you have a specific example? Because such questions are, are difficult to just manufacture. No? Okay, so then I'll try and find one that's as similar to that as possible. And the one in my mind is this one. 
So then on take-home quiz number two, I gave you two lines and said find where these two lines intersect. Okay, so then <coughs> on take-home quiz two, I gave you this question. I said that R is, R of T is 1, negative 1, 2, T uh, plus 1, 1, 0. Now, the book and other sources will will sometimes do it like this. Q of t, they'll say Q of t is negative 1, 1, 0 uh, t plus 2, 0, 2. Okay, now strictly speaking, there's nothing wrong with this. But if I want to find where these two lines intersect, Yes? Oh, that's not a question. That's a stretch. So then, if I want to find when, where these two lines intersect, <coughs> right, so then R, R looks something like this. It's not the same, but the, the idea is a, what I'm about to say is the connection. So then these two graphs, right, the, the blue portion and the red portion, do they cross? And the answer is yes, right? They cross right here. But now I have sort of a different question for you. Where is another place that exists, very common in your life, where the paths of things cross, but nevertheless, nevertheless those things never intersect? How about uh, a road intersection, right? That's the whole purpose of the lights, right? The paths of cars, they have to cross. Right, because some people have got to go that way, and other people have to go that way. And it's okay for their paths to cross, but it's not okay for, their path, for the vehicles to intersect in the same instant. Right? That's, the pr that's the problem we're trying to avoid. So then now, when a question is stated like this, when a question is stated like this, uh, you, you need to solve, do, they, do their paths cross? That doesn't mean that they have to cross at the same value, at the same time. Just do they cross ever? So, <coughs> so in order to solve this problem, what you need to do is you need to solve the equation R of T is Q of S, which is to say, I want to find, is there any point, even if it's at different times, T and S, where these two lines intersect? So how this is connected to your question is this, is that if I have some vector-valued function u of t, and I want to find where it crosses itself, I want to find where it crosses itself, then you need to solve the equation u of t is u of f. Because what's going to happen is it's going to be at the same place at two different times. And that's it. So that was the connection to this question. So then let's, let's solve this question really quick because it's <coughs> on the page. Okay, so then specifically what we need to do is this is saying that for R, for R, we have three equations. X is T plus 1. Y is negative T plus 1. And Z is 2T. Right, that's what R is saying. And Q is saying that X is negative uh, S plus 2, and Y is S, just S, and Z is <coughs> what? Just 2. Okay? So then now, is there any way that I can solve this equation? And the answer is yes. So then... Let's try and solve it. So then I need to say I need the x the x coordinate of r to be the x coordinate of y uh, of q and the y's to be the same and the z's to be the same. So of all the pairs of equations, the two x's, the two y's and the two z's, which one seems easiest to solve? Z. So let's solve that one first. So as for the z coordinate, that's saying that 2t is 2. So this tells me that t has to be what? t has to be 1. <coughs> Okay, so <coughs> if t is 1, if t is 1, now I know the values of all of the x, y coordinates, right? t can't be anything else. 
So x, y, and z all have to be equal to the following. x has to be equal to 2, y has to be equal to 0, and z has to be equal to 2. So is it possible for that to occur with q? So is it possible to occur with q? So this is telling me now I can solve, for example, this x with this x. So taking those two together, I can see that I need to be able to solve the equation 2 is equal to negative s plus 2. So this tells me that 0 is equal to negative s. So s is 0. So does s is 0 work? Does s is 0 work? So we can plug that into q, evaluate at 0, and you get what? 2, 0, 2. So is 2, 0, 2, is that the same point? Yes, right? So then what we're saying is that we have solved the equation, right? We have that r of 1 is equal to q of 0. So then the paths intersect. They intersect, but they don't intersect at the same value of the parameter. So it's just like when you drive through an intersection, right? Your path intersects with those other cars, but thankfully not at the same parameter value. <laughs> So any question about this example? Yes. Yes, generally what it is, what it is is that you will have two unknowns, S and T, or whatever variables you choose, names you choose to give them, and you will have three equations. So generally speaking, such a, si such a system is overdetermined. Okay, and the reason why it's overdetermined is because consider two lines in space. Okay, so then I can have two lines that are parallel. How many times do they intersect? Never. Right? I can have two non-intersecting lines that are not parallel. Such lines are called skew. They never intersect. Okay, and then finally, uh, as another example, I could have two coincident lines. Right? Like two cars, they're both traveling in the same path. Okay, where do they intersect? They intersect everywhere. Okay, or I could have them intersect at exactly one place. Okay, so then that's those things are, you know, uh, examples of something that's very common in math, which is called zero, one, infinity. So how many solutions are there in in a ver large, large category of problems? How many solutions? Zero, one, or infinitely many. Right. The intersection of two lines is they either do not intersect, they intersect exactly once, or they intersect exactly infinitely many times. Okay, good. So then now there's just a little bit of time left. So what else? <coughs> so that was something from Take Home Quiz 2. So other interesting things from Take Home Quiz 2. Let's do it. <coughs> so that one is easier because I know where <coughs> such questions are in the book. <coughs> so do you have a specific one? No? <laughs> okay. So then how about number 41 in the book? Okay, so then this is number 41. You are given the function r of t is 3t plus 2t squared. Or 3t like this in the first coordinate and 2t squared in the second. Okay, and the book says compute the curvature at one particular point, but I'm not interested in that. I want you to compute the curvature function generally. Okay, so then there are two <coughs> there are two applicable ways applicable ways to do this. One, the first way is you could take x is equal to three t, y is equal to two t squared, and use the curvature formula. The curvature evaluated at t is the absolute value of x prime y double prime minus x double prime y prime over x prime squared plus y prime squared all raised to the three halves. So we'll do this quickly. Right? This is for this particular question, this is the basically the easiest way to go. <coughs> so x prime, well that's three and x double prime that's zero. 
Right, you can already see that this is starting to be pretty nice. Y prime, that is 4t, and Y double prime, that is what? 4. Okay, so then with those things, now you can com compute the curvature function directly. So then the curvature function is the absolute value of 12 minus 0 over x prime is 3 squared is 9 plus y prime, so that's 16 t squared is 3 halves. So then now 12 minus 0, that's 12, and inside of absolute value, that's 12. So 12 over square root of 9 plus 16 t squared to the 3 halves. Okay, so there's the curvature function. Now what if I asked you to compute the curvature at 4? What would that mean? Plug in 4. Okay, how about, how about this? What if I was to ask you to compute mm, the curvature as x goes to infinity? It would be 0 because as x goes to infinity, t goes to infinity. So such a question would mean you would have to compute the limit as t goes to infinity of the curvature of t. Right, so then this thing in the denominator, right, the numerator is a constant and the denominator is clearly increasing. So then this is 0. So what is that saying about this function as t gets really big? What's happening to it? It's getting, it's, well, it's not necessarily, okay, so it is getting close to the x-axis, but, but that's a coincidence. What's happening here is it's becoming a straight line, right, because curvature is measuring, right, the inverse of the radius of the circle of curvature, okay, and if the circle of curvature is becoming infinitely large, that means that the graph is becoming flat, okay, so then uh, you could, how could you verify that it's becoming flat? So you could do it like this. You could say that, well, um, t is equal to x over 3, so that y is equal to 2x over 3 squared. So this is, what, 2 over 9x squared? So we have y as this parabola. So what this is saying is that as you go to the right, right, the parabola is becoming flatter and flatter and flatter. The graph of it is becoming flatter and flatter. Where is the curvature, the circle of curvature, right, that, that kind of curvature, where is the curvature of this parabola greatest? It's, it, it's greatest at zero. The greatest value of the curvature is at zero. Can you, what if I said, here's the curvature function, right? I said, here's a, here is a planar curve, for example, and I said, in the first step, compute the curvature function. In the second step, I say, find the minimizer and the maximizers of the curvature. How will you do that? Right, now it's a calculus one question, because now you have curvature as a function of t, right? Curvature is a function which takes a scalar to a scalar. So then what you can do is you just use calculus one techniques. You compute the derivative of curvature. You find where the derivative of curvature is zero or undefined. Then you use the, either the second derivative test or the first derivative test to show that these critical numbers are maximizers or minimizers. So then you could use that technique to show that the curvature is maximal at t is zero in this particular example. Okay, so then the last thing I want to say, because I know it's time to go, is this. You could solve the exact same question in this way. You could say that, you know, maybe, maybe memorizing this formula is just beyond the pale for you, okay? There's so many formulas to memorize. You could say, well, okay, R of t is a planar curve, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my imagination, and I'm going to say that actually this is a space curve. It's actually a space curve, but it just doesn't go anywhere in the z direction. It just stays on the, on the plane. So that you could say, well, I'm going to be reminded of this function, q of t, is equal to 3t, 2t squared, and then 0, which is to say, I'm going to think of it like a space curve, but it just doesn't go in the, in the k direction at all. 
So then, now you could use this formula, the curvature function, is equal to is equal to the magnitude of V cross A divided by the magnitude of V cubed. Of course, that's useful if you want to avoid memorizing that formula, but that's the long way round, right? Because you will determine exactly that formula. In fact, the way that formula is given is by showing that this one is true in space, and then considering the case when the, when the k coordinate is zero, and then showing that that formula is right. <laughs> okay, see you on Thursday. <coughs>